Hello everyone, for a second week in a row, Mother Nature stop us to from worship together. Um, I hope you're all well and remain safe during uh, the snowfall and that you did not injure yourself while, while uh, cleaning your car and your driveway. Uh, I think we should have a special talk for the people of Newfoundland who are literally buried under snow uh, these days and I sincerely hope and pray that everything will come back to normal for them. So once again from my basement I offer you the sermon I prepared for uh, Sunday January the 19th 2020. It's on John chapter 1 verses 35 to 42. So here it goes. Probably like many of you, I have a Netflix account. And about a week and a half ago, I finished watching the series called Messiah. I don't know if you have heard about it or seen it. So just in case you might not have done it, uh, the plot revolves around one simple question. What would happen if a messianic figure appeared today in the Middle East? The question is, is this mysterious man the real thing? Uh, the second coming of Christ, the return of Al-Masi or the Messiah, depending of to which uh, major monotheistic religion one belongs? Or... Is he a clever manipulator who pulls a hoax for obscure reason? That's the main question of the whole series. And to be honest, uh, I did not really care about the true nature of the main character. I was more interested in the reaction of the people he met through the 10 episodes. And as you can expect, the series uh, presents a full range of reaction from total and absolute rejection, doubts and confusion to blind faith that leads people to leave everything and everyone behind and follow this man. And all of this made me wonder about the key elements that convince someone to become a faithful disciple or simply to walk away. And today's reading from the Gospel according to John address this question, this interrogation. It is one of the numerous stories of call of a disciple we find in our New Testament. So after another uh, version of John baptism, last week I spoke about Mark's version of Jesus baptism. Now after John's version of baptism, John the Baptist is standing with two disciples. And as he watched uh, Jesus walking by, he exclaimed, look, here the here's the Lamb of God. The people around him probably thought, okay, sure, why not? This is a huge statement and you don't provide anything to, you know, to support it, but hey, why not? And the two disciples, after hearing John, decide to follow Jesus. Uh, did they want to investigate John's uh, statement? Have they been looking for someone who would quench their quench their deep spiritual thirst? Were they simply uh, curious? The text does not say. We just know that Jesus eventually turns and said, What are you looking for? Basically, what do you want? And naturally, we would expect the disciple to answer something like, well, are you really the Lamb of God? Or, 
Um, we're investigating uh, if you're the Messiah, the one we have been waiting for so long, or we're hoping that you are someone important that could improve our lives, or any other answers that could help understand who Jesus truly is. But instead, the disciple provide a strange answer. Rabbi, where are you staying? And we want to say, really? They only have one shot to make a good first impression, and that's the best they come with? Because what difference does it make if Jesus is homeless or live in a huge mansion? How can this help them to figure out, is he worthy to be followed? Why are they not inquiring about something concrete, about some hard facts like his origin, his credential, his training? And on top of that, Jesus' answer does not provide us more clarity on this whole story. He simply invites the disciple to come and see. This strange conversation makes me think about the old story I read in a book uh, a few years ago that goes like this. There was a shepherd who did not know how to pray. He used to say, God, you're the Lord of the universe. You know my reputation to be a very tough businessman. However, if you have a flock and you ask me to keep it, I will do it for free. For everything I got, I owe it to you. And one day a theologian heard the shepherd and decided him to help him to to helping by teaching him to pray with the appropriate words and accepted uh, principle and belief of the church. So once the theologian left, the poor shepherd was completely confused. He remembered nothing of the theologian lesson. And the only thing that remained in his head that is that his old way of praying was wrong. So he just stopped doing it. Later, a voice came to the theologian in a dream and said, You robbed me of one of my precious pearls of my kingdom. The disciples who followed Jesus were not looking for a long-winded sermon full of obscure theological truths. They were not interested to debate Jesus' place and nature and the whole concept of the Trinity. They did not want to be told how to pray and live their faith. The disciples just want to encounter Jesus. They wanted to be with him for a while and enjoy his presence. They were looking for something deeper by going beyond the mundane and at empty words. The disciples were striving to experience the presence of Jesus in their lives and discover where this, this, all of this could lead them. They did not want to be told the proper way to pray or to address him, but to discover his essence, absorb it, and let it guide their whole existence. For the last few centuries, I would say, Christianity has given a great importance on knowledge, teaching, and a reasoned way to understand our beliefs. Theological college still prepare future ministers with classes on systematic theology, biblical analysis, and translation of ancient Greek. And if all of this is, is useful, don't get me wrong, um, it leads too often to overlook the experimental side of faith. The theologian Fred Craddock says that ministers should always aim to bring the experience of the biblical text to the listeners, not just the content. Christianity did not begin with a long list of complex theological questions, a collection of wisdom quotes, or burdensome moral restrictions. Its origin is found 
in a man who shared a human existence, a man who had emotion, friends and doubts, and struggles, a man to whom we can relate. The disciple accepted Jesus' invitation. They went and they saw. What? Who knows? The text, once again, does not say much. It just said that they stick around for the rest of the day. Still, this encounter must have been quite something because right after it, Andrew found his brother Peter and told him, we have found the Messiah. And once again, notice the absence of long theological or biblical argument. Andrew did not describe any amazing miracles, surprising healing, or inspiring parable. He just felt it in his whole being. Andrew's testimony was based on the connection he has established with Jesus. This experience seems to be all he needed for making this powerful statement. And sometimes we are asked why we, be why we believe in God. Why do we support this specific church or this specific denomination? Why do we go to church? Well, we could do something else on Sunday morning like sleeping, for example. And these are very good questions. And most often we struggle to explain our reason, our motivation. We don't find the, the right words. We do not feel we could debate our faith or spirit, spirituality with logics and, and facts. We don't know where to begin when it's time to describe how wonderful our church is. Most often we can only talk about an impulse, a hunch, a gut feeling. We believe because we have come, because we have seen. We have answered the invitation to experience God's unbounded love and discover the sacred already surrounding us. We have opened ourselves in order to feel the presence of Christ in our lives. So why do we follow Jesus and believe he's the Messiah, the Christ? instead of following, I don't know, Roger or Melissa or some strange individual from Syria? Of course, one part of the answer is our education and the fact that our parents or our grandparents brought us to church. But at one point in our lives, we did not want to be told anymore. We had to make our own mind. We have to decide where our faith laid. So at one point, we have accepted Jesus' invitation. We came and we saw for ourselves. And today when we pray, when we read the Bible, when, to, when we go through uh, rough patches or face difficult decisions, when we don't have all the words to describe our feelings or our beliefs, we can rest assured because we have experienced the presence of Christ before in our lives. And we are confident that it will happen again. And we desire to follow him for this reason, wherever he may lead us. Take care of yourself. See you next Sunday. And bye-bye. Amen.